Thumbs up sounds like we're a go. Action. I've missed doing this with you. I know, it's been a long time since uh, we've had been able to spend some time together mm -hmm. and uh, talk about golf. We don't do that very often. I missed, I uh, really meant, uh, haven't missed. So you want to recap what's happened in all that time? Uh, or just get right to it? Yeah, it would take a little while. Let's get right to it, though. How about this thing? Have you seen the triple track ball yet? Yep, uh, Callaway's new golf ball, helping you aim, uh, I guess on the putting green mostly, but tell us why you think it's cool. I think it's a good one for... Uh, just teaching someone how to aim if they already like drawing the line on the ball. Personally, I'm not actually like a huge fan of the you know, Welcome to Golf Tech headquarters. Personally, I'm not always like a huge fan of drawing the line on the ball. It takes a certain amount of skill just to aim that right. But then uh, also drawing a straight line is a bit of a challenge for some people. So I do prefer teaching people how to putt just looking down at the white part of it. That said, I don't really care that much where if someone putted really well with a line or with this, uh, I'd tell them to do anything different, keep going, that's fine. Yep. Uh, this does make it easier to aim that line and when things are pre-drawn, it's much harder to yeah, make that's a mistake. Yeah, probably echo a couple of things you mentioned there. I've uh, I've never been big on putting much of a mark on uh, on my ball or even like on my putter. And uh, you're an amazing putter, by the way, for those uh, who don't know you. So I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing just to, to your suggestions, but I've just noticed that like if I have a line on anything, it just tells me how badly I am aiming. Uh, so I don't uh -huh. need any reassurance, but uh, to your point though, um, if you do get pretty good at aiming this, and like yeah. what we typically see like uh, with students, whenever we're doing like say some different assessments when they're aiming, uh, by aiming the ball better, they tend to aim their putter face oh. better as well too. Now what I am interested in doing is uh, putting the triple track putter that we have, sorry I can't show it to you, it's double super top secret still, but I have one here. I'm interested in trying the test of using the triple track putter and the triple track ball to see if that is now making a long enough line behind the, the golf ball and your putter head uh, where you can actually start to see a, a very long straight line. That might be really interesting and really help people uh, aim their putter better and probably make more putts. I'm down for that. And quite honestly, the worse you are, the more valuable this line really is on the golf ball. So uh, high handicappers, those who don't make many putts, I can see this being really cool. There's, a, there's something to that. Talking about these putters, though, did you see this one? This looks eerily familiar to something. Have yeah, it looks uh, a lot like another. Uh, so that one's called the Ten. Yeah. Uh, from this Odyssey. Is the Odyssey Ten. So it looks like a little more futuristic version of another popular putter out on tour, right? Super high MOI. This does look really forgiving with a lot of weight in the back uh, yeah. portion of that, mm -hmm. uh, but it does look eerily similar to that tight TaylorMade Spider, which is fine. I think that's a cool design. A lot of people like this, and the one that the part that grabbed me on it was really how thick that white line was on the very yep. top of it. That's the part that turns me off, but keep talking about it. Well, okay. I'll I told you, I don't, I don't like uh, the lines of my putter. I do like, uh, well, as you keep adding your two cents here in a second, what no, I do like about this. That's fine, just cut me off. I'm going to. Right. Uh, what I like about this uh, particular putter, though, I just like the edges being much sharper yeah. uh, compared to like to the spider, which it looks very mm -hmm. similar to and more rounded, softer edges. So uh, for some different players, uh, just the aesthetics of that, I know yeah. for myself in particular, I do, uh, I do like the look of that. Yep. And uh, our friends at Ping, my friend Paul Wood, who designs a lot of their clubs, he thinks a lot of people actually like having a very long straight line, so I think a thicker one might be a really good way to aim. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, kudos to Odyssey for making a really nice looking putter. That one looks good. Did you see the Bird of Prey too? I did. That one's, yeah. a, that one's a pretty unique design. I can't say I've seen much on the market uh, previously that looks really anything like that, especially with and the two uh, bars that are connecting the, the mm -hmm. much bigger uh, section in the back. It's definitely not a lot behind the face. Most of the weight is all in the back or on the sides of the club, so super high MOI putters are what they're after. And then I like the shaft. The shaft is really nice, a little bit of counterbalancing to that. Um, totally. I think this one is uh, a winner, other than I'm not a fan of these big grips either. Mm -hmm. I prefer just little skinny ones like that. Uh, like the 10 had, but I'm sure you can get anything you want on there, and that's personal preference too. And uh, I would uh, counter that one with my awesome putting skills. I tend to like uh, the thicker putter grips, but uh, you mentioned both of those are higher MOI. Um, you hear MOI talked a lot with drivers especially, so what? Uh, why is MOI important to the putter? Sure. Or what can like, the average golfer, why would that benefit yeah. them maybe? So if you do have a hard time hitting the middle of the putter face, then those high MOI putters are really good. These are very forgiving on miss hits. So where that becomes important is that if you do miss hit your putter a lot, uh, there's something wrong with your stroke, you could use a putting lesson. That's what we do a lot of at Golf Tech. But uh, the worse you are hitting the center of the face, the more consistent your ball speed's going to be. So you get the same 
distance of putt travels, even when you start mishitting it to some degree. Mm -hmm. So that's the value of it. Now, as you get better at golf, uh, sometimes there's a there's a diminishing return on that MOI and how useful that really is. Skinny grips, light putters, without a lot of shape, a lot of really good putters throughout history have really relied on that. Like uh, Ben Crenshaw, my friend Brad Faxon, Tiger Woods, you see the uh, more basic styles. So mm -hmm. this isn't always going to fix your problem, but it is an interesting uh, attempt at trying to help someone who is, is bad. This yeah. would be really good for someone who's bad. If you're a good putter, this may not be the putter for you. Yeah. But you got to test them and find out. But we did some just cool testing, not with this particular model, but just um, with some of the other high MOI putters that are out there compared to like your old Scotty Cameron bullseye, mm -hmm. and just uh, how consistent the ball speeds were hitting it across the face with the, the high MOIs versus your you know very small putter, blade style putters, like you said. So yeah. I think the biggest benefits your distance control with those high MOI ones for sure. Okay. We'll keep uh, sending in questions. Sorry if I forgot to say that. I mean, this is all just straight live. I'm just going to read some of the questions that are here. And some of them we asked from uh, students outside of just this uh, chat right here. So if you've, if you've submitted a question, we might get to it here. So while you're talking about the Callaway Maverick and how you've seen it on the USGA conforming list, what are your initial thoughts. Yep. I'm going to keep reading questions. So Callaway's uh, driver for 2020 is the, the Maverick. It just hit the USGA conforming list last Monday. You may have seen it in uh, some other publications. Golf Digest and everyone else was uh, really talking about it at the time. Uh, so we have it up on screen now, I think. Um, and this is just the stock photo from the USGA. So I know you can't tell, but uh, this year they're going orange. So the, uh, the toe and heel section that you can see on this one is orange. And uh, a big um, change really from last year maybe is going to be uh, just a single fixed weight in the very back so it's more similar to rogue uh, as far as that's concerned relative to um, you know epic and epic flash that we saw last year that did have the weight channel you can still see it as jailbreak and we'll cycle through a few pictures uh, they're going to have a sub-zero model as well you know i'm making a lot of assumptions just based off of uh, the images here but typically uh, sub-zero is their um, their more low spin option with that weight in the forward uh, portion of the head it helps with that and then uh, also on the list is their triple diamond so it looks very similar uh, almost identical as far as the sole plate is concerned um, but you notice right below the screw on the hosel adapter has your three diamonds that's typically just your more fade bias driver so anybody that fights a hook um, you know in general your better players typically uh, might gravitate towards that one uh, a little bit as well um, but What's interesting on these, and maybe get just your opinion on this, mm -hmm. uh, going away from the, the movable track to the, the fixed weight, um, you know, make some assumptions on that. What do you think that might be, or what could the benefit there be? Yeah, it must be, uh, well, it's speculate that it's easy, an easier design. It's easier to build and create that mold so they can probably use some weight somewhere else. Uh, I'd start with that. And then the adjustability needed for a three wood is just way less than what you can use really mm -hmm. for a driver. So now they can uh, offer a three plus, which is probably like a 13 degree three wood, yep. and a three, uh, three wood as well, 15 degrees or so, maybe even like a four plus. They can get back into that naming mm -hmm. convention again. So more options for buying golf clubs too, but yep. I'd say it's all, it's all weight based. Otherwise it, uh, mm -hmm. having an adapter is cool, but it's not necessarily all yeah, that useful for and that's what I think early. is probably with the fairway woods the the biggest um, change up. What's interesting is now it looks like just from these two images that they're going to a, a glued hosel, like you mentioned, um, which is interesting because they totally redesigned their adapter last year mm -hmm. for just the fairway woods and the hybrids. Um, mm -hmm. So then they did a redesign last year, and now they seem to be going away from it. So be interested to see uh, ultimately when some whatever does come to retail, uh, if it does look like these, it's possible these could be ones that they mm -hmm. were just getting on the list so that the uh, uh, guys on tour could use them, which is maybe possible. Yeah. Seeing guys like Stenson was hitting a, a glued Epic Flash yep. uh, in the last couple of weeks, so could be tour only product maybe. Um, okay, I got another one for you. One? Okay. Um, here's one from Matt from Facebook. Have you all done any tests on spin rate off of Matt's indoors versus grass outdoors? Any impact on spin rate or spin axis? Yes, so uh, spin rate in general is really a result of spin loft, which is the difference between the angle of the club face when you hit the ball and the angle of attack. But a huge variable inside of spin beyond just that one is the amount of friction you have between the club face and the ball. So the uh, for an iron anyway, the more friction you have, the better contact you make, the less dirt and debris and sand or grass that you get in between there, the more the ball will spin. 
So hitting off of a mat um, gives you almost a perfect lie every time. The ball, if you do hit behind it, it actually levitates ever so slightly off of a mat. And then that gives you just this perfect strike that's uh, not compromised at all by dirt and debris. So there's a, it's easier in some capacity to hit a ball off of a, a mat, especially if you've hit behind it. But uh, it will also increase some spin relative to ever so slightly mishitting or having just not a perfect lie outside. None of that really matters too much other than I think you take it into account that that's uh, going to ever so slightly change. Mm -hmm. It's getting much more consistent uh, when you're doing a fitting. Um, yeah indoors or is a mat in general just the you're minimizing variables i guess compared to what you might uh, get out there that you just yeah. don't have control over anyway we get a lot of uh, questions about well you can't possibly do a club fitting indoors or give golf lessons inside because of the mat and i just don't understand that whatsoever you're not really changing the variables enough if you hit behind a ball with the mat up here you'll know it your coach will know it it's no mystery or secret you might hit a better shot on a uh, or foresight quad launch monitors but it's not uh not something you should overcome or avoid. Mm -hmm. Chalk it up to a hit behind that one and let's go. Versus uh, outside, you would see just a massive difference in the shot, but it's, it's no different. Mm -hmm. uh, what else did we have in here? We had um, uh, future yeah. of drivers. Uh, this one was another one I yeah. discussed with so we, uh, we have a couple things we know are coming out in 2020. So Cobra has their new uh, speed zone driver. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we just talked about the Maverick. Um, everyone else is probably going to release something new for the most part. All right. Make some predictions. What do you think uh, either next year or, you know, yeah. five years from now? Well, I think we've uh, maxed out the, we'll always try to, I think all OEMs are, and all manufacturers are going to try to make their drivers higher MOI, and that's the moment of inertia, more forgiving drivers. The question then is how do I have a, like a really high MOI driver, super forgiving, and still swing it faster? Because mm -hmm. now you've tapped out how fast the ball speeds can be off the face, you're pretty much at the limit all yep. the time. You've heard of aerodynamics in the last couple of years yeah. with turbulators and things like that. Yep. So that's the uh, like Ping's attempt at trying to do that. Yep. Uh, to, can you grab that Ping right behind you? So changing the design maybe is something. So you've got just some curved surfaces and some ways to make you potentially swing this faster. I think that's important. However, I think the way that you'll swing this the fastest will be keep the MOI really high. Keep trying to design the, the crown of the club and even the sole to swing faster, but you're going to make the club smaller without losing the, uh, the MOI and the benefit of forgiveness. If they can make this club head instead of 460 cc's, uh, make it 400 and still just as forgiving and the face just as fast, so the ball still launches quick, you'll swing that faster. So that's where I think the, the, the next avenue is going to be. Mm -hmm. I would uh, echo some of that. I think it's going to go along the lines of, say, the MOI realm, trying to keep MOI really high. I just think uh, how they do that's going to change. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, like the movable weights, I could see some of those tracks maybe going away. You know, Maverick, we didn't see that. Only reason being is you only have so many usable positions in, in the weight tracks. But then mm -hmm. because you have that recessed area uh, to basically house the weight, you're basically pushing more material closer to the face, which in and of itself lowers your MOI. Yeah. Um, so I could see something along the lines of Maverick, where it's a single fixed weight in the back, uh, just to, again, keep the MOI high. Um, and then maybe just have a draw in a neutral model, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, here's one for you. I'm a 15 handicap. Am I going, or am I, go am I good enough to play the new Mizuno irons? Yep, uh, so the new Mizuno irons would be the uh, MP20s. They just had their line come out maybe a little more than a month ago, right? Uh, one here, yeah. uh, here's a couple, we'll grab a couple on the wall here. Uh, so there's the one everyone should play, MP20. Yeah. No, no, don't uh, listen to him, he's a liar. So there's the MP20 the MMC. I'm just looking for the H. The yeah, try to find the HMB as well. Okay. So we've got three in the new line. Two of them look uh, very similar. Uh, but the question, if you're a 15 handicapper, if you want to play the MP line, the one Nick's holding uh, would be an awesome option to at least test out. So it looks uh, very similar in the bag to just your MP20. So the one I'm holding is straight blade, you can only do so much technology when you just have a solid chunk of metal, right? Yeah. Um, but what's cool about the uh, HMB uh, is it looks really cool in your bag. So that's uh, step one when you're uh, looking for new clubs. But then it has the performance to go along with it. So basically this uh, whole internal cavity here is hollow. So it allows more weight to move out to the perimeter. So you get the um, functionality of a, of a cavity back, a lot of that forgiveness. 
but now you get some of the looks of a blade and then also being hollow is you get the ball speeds that you get with some of those max improvements. So, mm -hmm. uh, 15 handicapper, uh, I would definitely say this one's definitely feasible, uh, the MP20 uh, HMB. I'd at least oh, yeah. try it out and then certainly see what happens. It's um, worth a shot, a little bigger, and how tight we can get on this, but just a little, little thicker sole compared uh, to the MP20, just a straight blade, a little more camber um, to the sole too, so there's some forgiveness there, just the turf interaction. Sure. What uh, I also like too, um, we grabbed a shaft over there, is Mizuno, as well as some other manufacturers, you're seeing the steel fiber get added much more. Yeah. So it's becoming uh, more popular on tour, seeing some of these graphite shafts, and it's uh, you know not, uh, not graphite of old. So it's a graphite core, steel uh, outer layer. So you get some of the benefits of graphite when it comes to your energy transfer, but then the consistency that uh, a lot of people associate with steel. So super stable shaft. Um, but typically higher ball speeds. Mm -hmm. If you're testing out the HMB, that's an offering with that as well too. I'd throw it in there, or it comes in the Epic Forge now as well. Pretty much every manufacturer carries it. Yeah. Um, I know I'm probably throwing it in my irons this year. Yes, absolutely. It's worth trying. If you're interested in irons and you don't try that steel fiber, you're probably missing out on uh, maybe the best performing shaft you're going to get. I do like these HMBs. This is opening up a, the beginning of a new category that I don't think exists. They're, there have been attempts, and really, there is a really nice category of like a player's club that still has the distance benefits built into like the large clubs that you might find in everyone's line as well. But the offset's getting minimal. They're starting to look like actual golf clubs. I'm waiting for someone to actually build like a like that rogue iron from uh, a few years ago, but take no no offset. Mm -hmm. So just make it look like uh, the same offset design of a regular blade but make it like the most forgiving, highest launching rocket launcher iron. Yep. And I think that'll be a huge, yeah. huge Seems hit. Some people get closer and closer to that where you yeah. get a big, big forgiving club and at least less offset. Right. It's not maybe as little as you want, but yep. it's trending that way. All right, how about this one? Uh, what do you all think about building, a, and these, these do say y'all, I'm not making that up. Uh, what do you all think about uh, building a set of irons to grow into once I get better? Looking at blending a JPX set of 919 forged and tours, and that's from Bryce on YouTube. Okay, uh, so I guess it depends on what you mean by grow into. I'm assuming by grow into you mean just skill level. Yeah. That's uh, what you're getting at on that one. Mm -hmm. So you can go that uh, combo set route, um, going with the 919s and then the forged, uh, or the 919 tours and then the forged. Uh, what's nice about, say, the JPX line is they have a very similar just look throughout. Yeah. I mean, the heel to toe length right. is almost the same. You're just talking differences in um, differences in offset, top lines. Yeah. So if you're going that route. Um, you know, go with the less forgiving clubs in the wedges and maybe 8-9. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a route to go. I don't yep. think your uh, club head speed or anything like that's going to change significantly. Sure. It's got a follow-up question of, uh, is it worth waiting for the new product launches with the PGA show or getting fit uh, for something right now? I would say you could go either way on this. Now, the, uh, what I would do, though, is that if you need new golf clubs, if your clubs are literally holding you back from playing better, there is no point in waiting. Uh, what What is out right now is awesome. Uh, there might be some minimal improvements to some of these irons. We're waiting this a little longer for an iron. Maybe there's something to that, uh, maybe not. If you're playing old clubs and you just need something new or if something is really holding you back, there is zero reason to wait and, and ride out that storm. It's always gonna be another, uh, another line that's six months down the horizon. It's, yep. It's just that game you play. Get yeah, what you need right now. Just commenting on Bryce directly there, yeah. too, since he's talking about the JPXs. I mean, Mizuno has their 2020 irons out already, so Good if you uh, sound like a Mizuno guy, uh, their stuff's already out, so I'd say you know, go yeah. check them out today. Absolutely. We see too many people who are trying to take golf lessons with us, and they might be 10 lessons in, still playing clubs from 1985 that they had in high school, and uh, that is holding them back, and oftentimes they get the pushback of, well, the new stuff will be out in three months. Well, it's three months of trying to get better that you've just missed out on by waiting. Uh, thoughts on single length irons. How about standard length wedges through seven iron and single length from six iron to four iron? Uh, we've answered this one before. This one's from Greg on, on the Facebook chat here, or uh, sorry, the YouTube chat. Um, I, well, I understand the idea behind single length irons. The biggest challenge with that is the distance control from club to club. So while you might watch Bryson DeChambeau or an awesome golfer use single length clubs, I'm sure I could go out and play just fine with those. They aren't really the, the defining characteristic of why someone's playing well. 
the biggest challenge with those is actually hitting a shot and being able to control the distance. To do that, you have to have some command of your, your club head speed and your centeredness of contact and own both of those. So if I have a seven iron the same length as my eight iron, I can't swing my eight iron even a mile an hour or two faster than my seven iron, or pretty soon I have no gapping whatsoever in there. Right. So the hardest part is taking a club and swinging at the same speed every single time, and that's just not something the average guy is gonna benefit from. So uh, that's the biggest problem with it. There's advantages to having one length club you're gonna make, uh, attempt to make about the same swing with every single one. It's just not that simple. So I wouldn't tell someone to run out and buy single length irons because it's just not the answer to all the problems. However, I don't think it's like a big deal either. Yeah, and then there's another uh, bigger problem even uh, unrelated to swinging them is just getting them built like that. Yeah. It's not as simple as just ordering your clubs all the same length because there's uh, different line angle adjustments you have to make, significant ones as well as head weights. It's a, definitely a very custom build uh, and only so many manufacturers even offer that just as a even custom product from them. So mm -hmm. it's just hard to, hard to come by. Uh, I like this one, and it's one we don't talk about very much, so I can't wait to hear your answer and then say the opposite. Okay. Ready? Uh, this one comes from JZM on YouTube. It's I'm B, a female. B, Jay-Z? Yeah. No, B-J-Z-M. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. I'm a female golfer and watching you all, I now understand how important shafts are. What are your recommendations? How many grams? I'm a 14 handicap. Mm -hmm. uh, so the shaft is definitely important. We need to start there. Um, I think there's definitely an overemphasis put on it, though. It's about finding the right club head for starters, yeah. but then I believe uh, the question is directing in the right area. So based off of your speed, then, it's finding one that is the correct flex. And then if I had to pick any other variable um, besides color and looking cool, mm -hmm. uh, I'd try to find one that's a good, uh, good weight. In general, I would put people in clubs that are heavier usually. Yeah. just makes it... Uh, typically gives them a little easier chance of uh, swinging it and making consistent contact from time to time. Mm -hmm. So, um, super simple system. Find a club flex that matches your swing speed, and then um, don't be afraid to go a little heavier than maybe what you've used in the past. So depending what club you're talking about, that would be, you know, going up to even like a, for a lady, even doing like a 60 gram maybe yeah. uh, driver shaft would be fine. Yes. Uh, and more importantly, I think this one goes overlooked, but it's a huge part for, uh, for the females that play golf, is uh, when you hit a shot or on the downswing right before you hit the ball, the shaft actually from about this point up, about almost the top of the steel fiber logo, all the way down to the hosel, actually starts to bend towards the target. So it goes this way. I think a lot of people believe the shaft is actually bending away from the target when you hit. I don't have this together, so it's a little harder demo. It's not bending away. It's actually bending towards you or towards the target and upward. Now if the shaft is super flexible, this is a huge problem because if I have the ball sitting on the ground and the shaft is deflecting towards the target uh, a few more millimeters than what I'm predicting, it's now really hard to have a descending blow into the golf ball to launch it into the air when it sits on the ground. So I actually don't see the benefit of many female golfers, especially the better ones, in using shafts that are less flex, or I'm sorry, more flexible than men's regular because of the ability to hit it off the ground. Mm -hmm. and that story is not told nearly enough. I guess that's why we do these, but the less the shaft would bend here, the easier it is to hit the ball off the ground. It's not that you can't overcome that, but I've seen too many women who swing fast enough where this deflection becomes like a massive issue yeah. with hybrids and three woods. And hitting off the ground is obviously tough, and then just their centeredness of contact, heel toe. Yep. Uh, just an easy test uh, for anybody. Grab a really flexible club, like a driver, and try to hit a couple uh, couple cool swings, and. See how many times you hit the middle of the face. Yep, I like his last one that came through from Elliot. Let awesome. me do that one. Oh, uh, so Elliot said, new golfer at 65 years young, taking lessons from Golf Tech, loving it. Uh, six lessons in. Here's the question. How do I know when it's time to get a club fitting? I am using a 10-year-old Adams golf club. <laughs> so when should Elliot uh, get that thing checked out? Uh, I'll try to stop laughing enough. And we're not laughing at you, Elliot. This is, a, this is a question that comes up all the time. At what point should I be using it? So I would suggest if your driver is more than two years old, you're probably missing out on something new. Technology's changed a bunch since then, whether it's the MOI of the club or just the uh, amount of ball speed you can get off a driver, especially your irons. If those are two years old, it's worth doing a club fitting. And quite honestly, anyone who's serious about golf, every time you're going to buy a golf club, new set, a driver, whatever it is, you should get those looked at and checked out and hit the thousands of combinations that we have on the wall here. That's, that's how you'll make sure 
your new golf club doesn't become some ornament that sits in your uh, garage and just collecting dust. Another good rule of thumb is if you're using equipment from a club uh, company that no longer exists, yep. probably time for a club fit. I hadn't thought about that. That's so, pretty good. Adams, Nike, get them out of your bags. Okay, this comes a little bit uh, uh, full circle from a comment I made earlier, but uh, number six on this list that we got was, why do equipment companies feel the need to come out with the new products every year? Does their equipment become obsolete that quickly? Yep. What do you say? Um, so I guess it depends on how you say obsolete. They're obviously not gonna just roll out a new product for the sake of uh, mm -hmm. rolling it out. It's just a matter of, um, are you gonna see benefits and does the cost justify that as a yeah. consumer? So. Uh, every product that does come out, there is sl something slightly different about that, and it's just a matter of testing it and see if that slight difference helps you. I mean, it's very possible that we could see a club come out that actually could be worse for your game, but mm -hmm. there's 10 other people it's better for. So, um, does it become obsolete? Uh, I wouldn't quite word it that way. It's definitely different. Yeah. Companies, a lot of these companies have their uh, quality assurance team really, uh, most of them have to demonstrate that this is better than previous years, even if it's just a little bit before they'll roll it out. Ping in particular is really good about that. They're not allowed to introduce a new product unless they can demonstrate it's better. Mm -hmm. I like it. That's awesome company culture too. Uh, this one was interesting from Russell on YouTube. I have an iron fitting with Golf Tech in January. Let me know what is going to happen. Perfect. Uh, who's it from? What's the name? Russell. Russell. All right, Russell. Uh, so iron fitting in January. Uh, well, typically that would start with just checking out uh, the clubs that you currently have. So what we'd always like to do is just measure what you do uh, currently have in your bag. Just even things as simple as um, like the length of them to see if there is just some gaping problems there. I mean, if you're say 6'4", but you have uh, clubs that are standard length, mm -hmm. there's at least a chance that could be causing some problems. Test those clubs out and talk about how they're performing. Uh, based off of your club head speed, we'll get some recommendations as far as what your launch angle should be, what your backspin should be. And then from there, it's really just uh, you testing out some different clubs with your fitter and uh, seeing how those numbers compare and making a decision after that. Yep. Got a question about Baby Yoda. Uh, if Baby Yoda got fit, what would you fit him for? Real short clubs. Anything else? I don't know. He's a Jedi. He might be able to handle yeah, those long could ones. Could be. I hadn't thought about that one. Uh, this one I thought was good. Uh, it's a different kind of question that we've got from Bryce again. What are your thoughts on uh, direct-to-consumer companies like Hogan? Uh, so there are some companies now just selling from their retail factory straight to consumers. I suppose that's fine. Uh, I would think mainly what you're doing there is you're rolling the dice on what it is that you're going to get versus what you need. So while I would say that seems like a a good option. There's really no substitute for getting fit with someone who has a wide array of options for you to hit, the experience to know what you need, and someone who knows golf well enough to uh, give you the right tool for you. Because I think uh, what's, it, what's, what's easy about that is that you don't have to talk to anyone. You mm -hmm. can just decide, oh, I want this set of clubs and I'll buy it. And the price is even probably re like really cheap for uh, what you're going to get. But what you're more likely to have is multiply that by 10, the, the odds that you're going to not like those things in a month. And all that time, energy, and money is just wasted anyway. This is one of those things where, uh, as of right now, you really need to see someone who can help you yep. to make sure you get the right stuff. It's Whether best. it's gapping or the wedges you need or the right loft on your driver, the right flex of the shaft, those are not something you can do just as a hobby. Mm. Uh, people buying golf clubs don't know the answers to that relative to someone like the professionals we have all the time, the coaches that we have who fit golf clubs for a living. Would you argue with that? No, I think uh, the direct-to-consumer model is just a very, uh, aimed towards a very particular individual that uh, maybe likes to get new clubs all the time where they just know their specs because they've been using them for years, but then it's just the yeah. average student that we face um, for the most part needs to go through the fitting, the average golfer for that matter, right. needs to go through some sort of fitting with some guidance. Things Otherwise, have changed. Like yep graphite and steel combination shafts that weigh 95 grams and perform awesome. You mm -hmm. should be trying this in a set of irons. Yep. If you don't, you're uh, not doing yourself any good and you may just be slowing down your progress anyway. Mm -hmm. Again, just for the investment you're going to put into it, take that extra you know, okay. day and go through a fitting. Ooh, what do, what do you all consider a fast swing speed from JMZ again, famous rapper? Didn't know, uh, didn't know they were a golfer. I think it's all, I'll answer yeah. that one, it's all relative really to uh, everyone else. So I don't think fast really is defined or it's very dogmatic just to say, yeah, the whole point again is for us to tell you what you need. We can't even say you swing fast or slow. 
I've seen even like club fitting systems that are based around someone uh, arbitrarily or uh, subjectively determining how fast you are from the top of your swing down, your, your tempo Your tempo, is. the popular it's one, a, right? Sorry, that's a joke. Uh, it's like <laughs> a bad, bad joke. Uh, you need to see someone who can measure what it is you're doing, watch you on a launch monitor, they'll help you pick the right shaft. So sorry if I'm not really defining what fast is, I really can't, I think it's uh, dependent on you. If you want to say who swings fast, I'm going to tell you every long drive hitter that I've seen, Tiger Woods swings fast, Brooks Kepka swing fast, everyone else swings slower than them. Yep, it's very relative, just you know, hard to say, it's uh, all just about you and what you need, so that's why having mm -hmm. Uh, going through a fitting, uh, it's going to keep echoing that, but having some kind of technology in that fitting just to quantify everything, keep it yep. much more objective. Okay, another question just came through. How important is it to be fit by a top 100 fitter? Okay, I like the recognition. I think all these lists, like you've probably seen the Golf Digest Best Teacher lists and how many golf tech coaches are on that now. We had 35 on it this time. I like those lists. I appreciate those for sure. It shows that something is being uh, taught there that's of high quality. Uh, the top 100 fitter list I think is great as well, but more importantly than that is uh, so many great uh, coaches who are excellent club fitters aren't recognized on these lists because there are so many people. You can't find them all. You can't find the best everywhere. It's just not possible. The lists give it like the best try at that, mm -hmm. especially the peer voting ones. Now the uh, top 100 fitters list is great. It has plenty of awesome fitters. You shouldn't be afraid of anyone on that list for sure that they're going to cause you to waste your money. They're going to give you a good uh, experience, a good appointment. That said, I would say the best fitters are actually the ones uh, who have different qualifications. They're the ones who fit people for golf clubs regularly. They're also ones who are expert at helping people play better golf so they can help you hit a ball better uh, in spite of your equipment or as well as using that in conjunction with the two. But they're good at both of them. Uh, I don't think the best way to go through a club fitting is actually to find someone who uh, their living is really made from whether or not you buy golf clubs from them and they don't even know too much about how to help someone play better or they don't practice that enough. I think that is a serious skill you need because it's, what it's really doing is rounding out your education on how much do you know about this event that happens when you hit this ball and where it's going to go and the 80,000 different ways that it can get there and uh, helping you find exactly what you need because it maybe isn't your golf clubs. Maybe that's part of it, but it might. it's more than likely if you have chronic problems with the game you're not buying your way out of it with new golf clubs. Uh, you'll get good experiences from these top 100 fitters, but I'd try to go a layer further. Find the top 100 fitters who maybe also teach golf. Uh, lots of those are golf tech coaches or golf tech locations. So obviously that's a plug for us in that regard, but I really truly believe that if, uh, if you're just a fitter of golf clubs, you're, you're actually not necessarily the right one for the job. I think it's a good uh, just segue into this question as far as could be your swing or could be your club. So Dallas said, uh, New golfer, has some used uh, Titleist clubs, so 716 AP1s, an 816 hybrid, 915, 917. So his newest, uh, his newest club is from 2017. Um, and basically saying, should he do lessons or fitting? And this coming back to kind of a remark you made earlier. Mm -hmm. Really, if he has something more than two years old, uh, it's at least worth exploring the equipment to see if it is holding you back. So yep. he's got some clubs in there that are two, three, four uh, years old there, even yeah, about four years old at the fairway wood. Uh, so Dallas, I would uh, look into both. I mean, the instructions are uh, not going to hurt the cause by any means. See if some of the problems you encounter are swing related, but then just testing out some new equipment and see what you find. Looked at it as a fact finding mission. Uh, if you can pick up another 15 to 20 yards by just getting some new equipment, that's certainly going to help you out. And then yeah. if there are some swing issues in there, you can address those as well. Sure. Oh, we get some crazy questions on YouTube here, but uh, who would you recommend for putter fitting since you don't seem to offer it at the moment? Uh, good question, Bryce. I think a lot of these have been pretty good, but mainly um, uh, the putter fitting piece. Uh, your coach, whoever, a golf tech coach can help you find a putter that's a really good fit for you. We do measure putting strokes with our uh, the Biomech putting sensor that every location has. So you can get a really nice putter fitting without us really formally screaming a, a marketable product that we have. That said, I'm going to have some new training aids that should be in this building here real soon. All those will ship out to locations in January, and then we're going to have this awesome putter fitting system that will be uh, about as technical as you want it to be or as simple as you want it to be, too. And both of those things, I think, are really important. So it would be a good way. Uh, uh, think about that one for January. If you want a new putter, get it now. But if you want to uh, explore your putter and wonder if it's going to be good for you, your golf tech coach is going to have a very cool new tool that they'll be able to use in January. And you should at least check out yours on that fitting system and make sure that it's what you need. I mean, I think that confirmation of 
the putter that I have right now, that's never what we're doing anyway. We're not trying to sell you new putters. We want you to be able to look down at yours, know that this is the best fit for you, and go play golf. You don't have to buy a new one from us. Uh, that confirmation is important, though, to, to playing your best. I like, uh, so Richard had a good comment, just a couple up there. So uh, coming back to the steel fiber shafts, he mentioned he was fifth for some clubs recently, or just a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, he found that there was just a nice balanced shaft with the steel fiber I-95. So that's the one yeah. we held up. Um, so just a good example there and a good plug uh, for that particular shaft and only because he mentioned the word balance. You may typically find that with that model as well. They tend to have a little bit of a counterbalance to them as well. Some players will like that. Um, mm -hmm. So here's, I think uh, just from the remark there, Richard seemed a little surprised that he ended up liking it as much as he did. So sure. it's going back to try them out. You pretty much get them from every manufacturer at this point. Um, see if they help you out. Yeah, Mark's question. The putter I use works best on a course in New Orleans. Have you ever been to New Orleans? Yes. I'm currently playing off a nine, hand, nine handicap and taking lessons at Golf Tech 3 of 15 credits in, fixing a lot of bad habits, and I am planning on a driver iron hybrid fitting. Brian, that's awesome to hear. That's an important part of it. I'm sure your coach, uh, it, during your swing evaluation, your first appointment, showed you how, will outline how you can get better, but a big part of that is just checking to make sure your clubs aren't holding you back. That's what that appointment will be. At that point in time, you'll be able to test a driver and a fairway wood or hybrids, whatever it is that you want, and you and your coach will be able to see whether or not what's out there versus what you have can help you play better and then leave it to you to decide if you want that. It's never a pushy sales uh, appointment at all. It's a fact-finding mission, which is, again, the way I think those should go. Uh, and then to follow up then with Brian as well, too, he was just wondering uh, when it comes to the fitting, uh, if he should just wait till he's done with all the lessons. So I think this comes back to no. um, it may not even mean doing the fitting sooner rather than later. If, uh, if you find out that you can pick up 20 yards for starters, I'd rather find that out yeah. in lessen three or four yeah. versus lessen 15. And you may find out that the clubs you have are just fine. Mm -hmm. That's a totally uh, possible outcome as well. Sure. More than half of the people who come in for a driver fitting end up leaving with 20 yards. That's one of the most common complaints when people come in is that they want more distance. So there's a quick and dirty way to help you get there. Uh, and then don't wait. Um, that's the hardest part of all this. If you're playing with clubs that aren't, aren't really well fit for you or they're just not good in general, uh, if, whether the tech's old, the specs are uh, inaccurate relative to what you need, uh, all of that is holding you back from getting better. So if you're just waiting three more months until something new comes out or until you just want to see if your game changes, you're, you've wait, you, you're waiting too long. And you could even play that game forever. So right. I wait three months, see if it changes. Well, what if I wait three more months or yeah. three more months for the next one? When club? does it end? Mm -hmm. Go Jerry. Sure. Does the club fitting include a, a grip fitting? Does it matter? Um, so yes to a degree so we'll get some basic measurements um, based off of your hand size so these get a starting point for grip but uh, really i've never seen any kind of objective data saying bigger grip causes x ball flight um, or the opposite so when it comes to grip a lot of that is really just personal preference um, some golfers will like more of a mid-size versus a jumbo that's why they make all the different ones they do as well as texture cords versus your apps and colors uh, you get all sorts of different options um, and that's just part of the fitting just talk about what you do like so personal preference, really, when it comes to grip, we can make some recommendations. But uh, if you like one versus the other, we'll make sure we go that route. Smart clips. Hey, guys, want to come on my podcast? Maybe. Is that a good answer? Yes. OK. All right, let's go Maybe. with that. If you want to, feel free to reach out to us here. But uh, um, the two of us look cute together. That's nice. Did you read that one? I did. I, once someone asked if we were dating. I said, it's, no, sometimes it feels that way. It does. Gosh. Oh, man, that would be awful, wouldn't it? All right, let's keep getting into some more of these. I'm playing a driver for two, from two years ago. To me, that doesn't seem that old, but do I need to look into getting a new driver? Do we need to say it again? Yes, repeat yep. it. Good information. <laughs> if your uh, club company no longer exists, if your stuff's two years old, it's mm -hmm. worth checking out. You might find out it's the perfect driver for you. Awesome. Um, odds are, though, you'll probably find something that at least performs a little bit better, and then it just comes down to if uh, you want to spend the money for that. <laughs> I like this one. And it, I'm always amazed at some of these questions. They're pretty entertaining. From Baby Yoda to, hey, guys, which golf brand is better for someone who plays golf to impress his boss? Anything that we carry here is from a major manufacturer. I'd say if you wanted to uh, just look at, start looking at brands, Ping, Callaway, TaylorMade, Titleist, Mizuno, um, those are all really good starters for sure. Mix in a little bit of Cobra there, and I think you got something. Not related, but who's going to win the President's Cup? Do you even know? 
Um, Predict the really future. Playing golf in December? Is we that are. happening? Yes. Uh, we, America, U.S. always seems to do pretty well in the President's Cup, right? We do. We can't yes, win the Ryder, the Ryder Cup, Cup for some reason, right. even though the President's Cup should, in theory, be harder. So let's go. Uh, let's go. Sure. Good old USA. Okay. Without giving away any info on em embargoed product, that means stuff that we're not supposed to be talking about. Hmm. Uh, anything? Is there a new piece of equipment you're most excited about in the new year? Yep, we got uh, one really cool driver out that I would love to tell you about. Um, unfortunately, we have to wait till the embargo is lifted. Set you up really nicely for that yeah. one, didn't we? But it's going to be awesome. Just wait. <laughs> oh man, more crazy questions coming in. Okay, uh, on this wall, if you had to pick something that was terrible for a bad golfer, what would you pick and build for them? Let's start with a driver. Oh, a driver. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't know this is that for actual a bad question, golfer. So. What yep. kind of ball flight does the bad golfer have? Slicing doesn't bad have golfer too much spin loft, way too much spin. Okay. Um, so I would pick any kind of driver that has the uh, CG in the toe. Uh, so if you um, slice, and then you have any kind of driver that has a CG in the toe, so it'd be like a fade bias driver. That would be a bad place to start. Well, we have this one in lefty, but the. Yeah. Uh, the M5. Oh, yeah. yeah, lefty driver, if you're right, it would be a, a terrible decision <laughs> as well. That would be bad. I hadn't thought about that. Well majority, done. That was pretty good for you. Thanks majority for of the uh, majority of the tailor-made stuff from last year, though, was all very fade bias. Mm -hmm. uh, so it works awesome for a player that uh, hits a draw, but that's why it's important to like go through a fitting with people that have actually measured these things. Yeah. Well, we've shown that at ad nauseum, too. Maybe we can put that it's even in the... For you. Is that a six? It's a six. Okay. Same thing. Close enough. So we did, we've looked at where the CG is so many times in the content. Maybe we can put a link in the description for a, uh, a couple of examples of how moving the center of gravity around on the face horizontally really can affect uh, which way your ball curves. The tailor-made drivers from last year, I know I get a lot of pushback on this from people who don't necessarily believe me, but the CG on these relative to the center of the club tended to be pretty close to the middle or ever so slightly towards the toe. So that makes everything that is on this side of my index finger there uh, fit more fade bias, which I think was really good for someone who overdrew, but if you already slice and you're an average golfer, the M5 and M6 driver might not have been the right fit. Now that said, I would probably figure out a way or I could have fit anyone who walked through the door into an M5 and M6 and got a good fit out of it too. So it's not uh, the total limiting deciding factor, but it did make it harder for these to be uh, really well fit drivers. Yeah, it plays a role and that's just why it's important again to have a, a expert fitter to help you out because very rarely do we find drivers when we measure these things where the sweet spot or the center of gravity is actually in the middle of the face, not because of manufacturing issues, just because that's the way the club's designed. Um, so. Right. Any good ones in there? Uh, a lot of people can't see you all of a sudden, hmm. so they say. I don't believe them because uh, I see a lot of other people commenting the opposite. Uh, is a soft golf ball a slow golf ball? I think that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I would uh, tend to agree with that. Now it's all relative. You're not talking like 10 miles an hour ball speed change, but sure. uh, you know, just thinking of like say the long drive uh, golf balls we use, or just worried about um, distance. They're really high compression. It's kind of a uh, archaic term at this point, but mm -hmm. really hard golf balls compared to some of your softest ones, just the hard ones uh, always tend to get higher ball speeds. Yeah. So how much? It's going to depend on the player. So you're kind of diminishing returns, but okay. typically a harder golf ball is faster. Doesn't okay. mean it's going to go farther, but it just means the ball speeds might be faster. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's important to know. Um, I wouldn't be worried so much about soft and hard with a golf ball when trying to pick it out. That's a, a variable, but it shouldn't be your only one. Yeah, it just depends prioritizing for your game what you need. Yep. Uh, I'll turn that question on its head that I asked you earlier. What would be the worst driver on the uh, rack up here for a really good player? So the total opposite, if you drew a ball and you hit it really far and you were good at golf, all of these draw bias drivers like this M6 uh, uh, D-type, that center of gravity has moved tremendously towards the heel. So while I still think a good player could still be fit into this if you're a, a very good fitter you know exactly where that's going to be and why it's there what it's really doing is making anything that's to uh, this side of my index finger uh, very draw bias so even shots right in the middle of the club tend to draw that isn't uh, at all what you need if you're really good and you already hook so grabbing a draw dra bias driver it does matter this is a, a big influencing piece for people who aren't very good or who slice too much uh, it can help you quite a bit it's not the answer to everything but it is a good start, but if you're good, do not use these things. And don't use really anything that uh, doesn't give you some ability to make sure that the center of gravity is near the middle of the face. 
want to uh, want to take that to another level. Let's just say if you are that same slicer, uh, what would be a good driver to try out? This Any one. Favorite? Your slicer? Yeah. How about another one. Super forgiving. <laughs> Ooh, that one backfired on you a little bit, huh? Uh, anything up here? I would say the TS two or three, if, uh, especially the two. Mm -hmm. If you put a heavier weight in that, we actually found that the MOI, because we do measure the actual forgiveness of each of these driver heads that come through, and we do that over multiple heads, so we can take an average of that or really actually know what it is. If you take the TS2 head, can you grab that one? Uh, top. Uh, take the two, TS2 head, and instead of using a lightweight in the back, and put a heavier one in it, maybe even shrink up the shaft an inch or half of an inch, and suddenly you have a very, very forgiving driver. Maybe the most forgiving one that uh, can be made. I think this is what we found. TS2, heavier weight, Put the plus six gram six, weight in the back. And yep. then make it a shorter shaft to balance out the swing weight, and this is an awesome club. Yep. If you want accuracy, this would be it. Yep, MOI went up to almost like 5,600, I want to say. Another great option uh, on a similar note would be just your ping, uh, your G410. Um, so another one like out of the wrapper was just super high MOI. So if you do uh, just struggle in the middle of the face, because that's where that's really going to help you, but just directional in general, TS2, G410, would be at least off some uh, options to put into a fitting. Okay, uh, I got Drew from face Facebook. He's, he's asking you a question of my irons are too, are toe deep. I think what he's describing are the divots, but I draw the ball. How would you re still recommend, or would you still recommend a more upright line angle? So the question really is that I, I hit a shot, and my divot, the amount of turf that comes out, really looks like I've got the toe of the club digging in more than the heel. Should I start changing my line angle? Um, no, because the divot in of itself is a tricky one to measure. The first part that's challenging, why you see so many toe. Uh, toe heavy divots or see like the patch of ground that's gone and how it looks a little deeper on the toe side is the way the club actually carves through the ground. It hits about the center of the club and then as the toe of the club is even closing in there it's just lowering this toe end. So your divots are always, unless you're doing something very strange, going to look like they're toe deep. So first don't use your divot as this barometer of whether or not you're doing anything right or wrong. It can help, there's some certain info you can get from that, but it is not the, the main generator of making your decisions. So with that out of the way, if you, are, if you hit little draws and you don't want to curve more, uh, having a club that's more upright or sits more on the ground to this uh, sort of angle, but not to the same degree, that helps you push more, which can open the club face to the path and reduce some of the curve. I would suggest mainly that you get fit for the line angle that you need relative to uh, the spin axis of the ball coming off pretty straight, um, so the line angle hitting the turf somewhat close to the level to the ground. But if you wanted to err, you could err on a side of a little bit flatter. I wouldn't try to fix someone's game by giving them the perfect line angle, though, if they hit the shots that they want. I'd suggest probably two-thirds of the PGA Tour is not appropriately fit for a line angle. They're just fit based on, they, they make a swing. The line angle is something pretty close to standard, and wherever the ball starts going, they just use that as the barometer. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't some adjustments doesn't have to be perfect beyond that. Mm -hmm. What you're really trying to avoid is that if you don't draw and you hit shots where the toe of the club is digging in more, you're aiming the face more to the right of your target, uh, to the left of where you guys are sitting right now, but that's uh, it's helping you slice more. If anything, you're more inclined to play better if you have the face angle slightly more upright. I'm still not always suggesting that. I would just suggest hit it flat to the ground. There's a whole other world that opens up when you start changing loft and lie angle that really can alter the angle of the face. So uh, if you draw and you draw too much, I don't always suggest going flatter. It's just a better idea than too upright. And there's airing on the side that could at least have a chance of helping yeah, you out, right? Yeah. So we uh, backtrack a little bit here, but just a general golf ball related question. Kind of talked about this, uh -huh. but a uh, lot of my students, weekend players, hit it 210 off the tee. Um, so for those golfers that hit it, say, 210-ish, uh, does the golf ball matter? What's an easy way to test for it? So it's a start with for your average golfer, does the ball matter? Yeah. Okay. What what, uh, what are we looking at when it comes to golf ball? What should you uh, be paying attention to? Spin rate more than anything. Spin rate, launch angle, but mainly spin rate. So I would do that with your favorite club, whether it's your driver that you want to get more distance out of. If that's your predominant problem and you want more out of it, I'd start there. Mm -hmm. So if you spin your driver too much, you need a lower spin ball. That's also detrimental some to some degree around the greens. It's harder to hit those high soft shots that land and don't roll out, but I'd suggest that. 
Otherwise, if you have a problem with accuracy with your irons, you could certainly hit some shots on the launch monitor there. You're looking for something between four and probably 6,000 RPMs of backspin. Sometimes uh, you want more than that if you swing faster. But uh, an expert coach really needs to be a part of that with you, unless you can magically find a launch monitor out somewhere and you know exactly what spin rate you might want, which and you could find several, on our channel. Several if you dozen dig around. different uh, models of golf balls and as well. You try them all. Yep. Yeah. And that's uh, something we talk about in the club fitting too, is at least uh, when you're going through a fitting based off the club you gave, mm -hmm. we'll give you some recommendations for some different balls. So yep. if you're totally in the dark and you are coming into a golf tech for a fitting, uh, a ball recommendation will at least be a part of that. Yes. And that kind of segues also into to Joe's question here. Uh, when getting fit, should I plan on using the golf ball model, golf ball model that I use in play? Uh, for sure. So if you're going in for a fitting, um, obviously you're going to have your clubs with you. If you have a couple of the balls that you do play, um, that's obviously what I would use during the fitting. Typically, at least in a golf tech, we'll have several dozen of uh, your major manufacturer balls. Mm -hmm. But at least that way, uh, if you do like that ball, then you're just minimizing variables. You're only changing the club at that point. So you, you had a hard time reading that. It was just hard getting the words out. Model's yeah. a big word. No. A lot of syllables. On that, uh, man, do I have the right question here. What will help me gain distance, a fitting or arms like Brad? Um, I'll answer it. You just sit there. You're turning a little red. Uh, well, both. I do think the faster, stronger, bigger you are, the easier it is to start hitting the ball far faster. Uh, kind of like uh, muscle is very much like money. When you have it, you can learn how to do all sorts of things with that thing. Uh, it doesn't just have one use. Now, that said, most people are just losing distance because of their swing form. So I think the concept that we describe all the time of spin loft is important for people to understand with their driver. Uh, you can find that ad nauseum here on our, on our channels about how that works and find some cool graphics. Uh, now, the next part, though, is being fit for your driver. So if your spin rate is uh, way too high or you're having a hard time hitting the center of the face, that is going to rob you of some distance that you really need. So I would put them in the order probably of uh, your swing form, most important, the fitting being the second, and then likely, uh, you know, a, an 11-year-old girl is not going to hit it as far as a 30-year-old uh, grown man who works out. So you've got to have some strength to be able to swing fast too, but your technique trumps that all. We've, we've had a few bodybuilders even come through golf tech before, uh, and they're terrible at golf. They can't hit the ball very far because of the spin loft concepts and then also their swing form stinks. So it doesn't matter. You really need to round out all of that, but put the conditioning, strength, fitness level as the last part. Not the first, the last. Agreed. Okay. Uh, super quick one. Um, when do the golf manufacturers release the new year models? So typically you'll have a fall release, which for the most part has already happened. So I'd look for a lot of the new stuff coming out then. Uh, It'll be typically February-ish, kind of right after the PGA show. So mm -hmm. kind of fall and uh, late winter, early spring would okay. be the two biggest ones. Well, here's a question about uh, wedges, mm -hmm. and I think this is the perfect time of the year to talk about new wedges anyway. So while the tech is going to change tremendously on irons and drivers, fairways and hybrids, wedges, it'll change some, but not enough to alter your decision making. If it's time for you to get a new wedge or yours don't spin the way you want or you just don't hit them real well, it's now is your shot. It's a perfect holiday holiday gift here. How do you choose wedges? And they're not asking about the loft so much, but uh, because there are so many different balance options, and I'll even go a step further there with grind options. Mm -hmm. what do you got? Um, so if you're going to make a blanket statement, I would say uh, on the bounce part, erring towards higher bounce. So uh, especially for your average golfer, that bounce is just in there as an insurance policy. So if yeah. you do hit it a little bit heavy, your next shot, you're at least uh, on the green and putting versus chipping again from like a foot in the front. Yep. But what's cool about that is uh, pretty much every high bounce wedge manufacturer now, uh, you can get the high bounce feature, but then still have some kind of grind to it. So they all have some kind of heel relief where, just for example, they'll, they'll round out this uh, heel portion of a wedge. So that way, whenever you do open it up, the leading edge doesn't sit really high off yeah. the ground. So you can kind of get the benefits of both worlds if you are a player that you like to open it up. Um, you can still do that, even with a, a high bounce option whenever you do have the leading edge pretty square. Mm -hmm. So. If I had to pick a number, I'd say uh, the lowest bounce I would go would be 10, and I think the lowest I have in my bag is probably 12. Yeah, if you're on the fence of choosing a bounce option, always just go with the high one as a general rule. A uh, question up here a little bit further was, uh, how much of an improvement can exotic shafts possibly provide over standard shafts? 
So typically what you're going to get is just with the, the exotic shafts is uh, two things. You have just better materials. So mm -hmm. the materials that they're putting into those are just higher end. And then they're just held to, to tighter tolerances um, whenever they are building them. So a lot of the, the OEM shafts is uh, OEMs go to a shaft manufacturer. They say, I like this shaft you guys make. Uh, can you make a similar profile with you know, cheaper materials? Yeah. Um, so then just whenever you, that shaft might work great for you during a fitting. Uh, but then the likelihood that you're going to get a very the exact same thing if you actually order that could go down. So the biggest thing you're getting uh, when it comes to exotic shafts is just you know from shaft to shaft to shaft they're very similar. That being said, going through a fitting you might find that uh, the stock shaft is perfect for you and that um, that's all you need. Yeah. So that's why you just have to test them out and really find it. A lot of these are just uh, trial and error almost when it comes to the shaft world especially. Mm -hmm. So coming back to flex and weight. Yep, and flex and weight are the most important ones to get right. If cool, you're trying to and cool graphics, yeah, and don't fit your shafts off of your tempo from the top of your swing down. Yep, don't worry about tempo, uh, how you load the shaft, things like that, or just all subjective ways yeah. of uh, not even measuring, just subjective ways of talking about a it. A lot of black magic out there yep. in golf, and some of it is uh, tied to that too. So that's where we're trying to separate ourselves with a. If it's not a very measurable thing, we'll let you know, and then watch out for it. Trying to just help you make good decisions with buying golf clubs or taking golf lessons too. With that, no more questions are really coming in. And I gotta do some other stuff. So we're done. What'd you do today? Did you do anything fun? Uh, did I do anything fun though? Okay. No, it's been a good day though. I can't complain. Was it fun though? It's, really? been, a, it's been a fun uh, 56 minutes here with you. Yeah, uh, something like that. I'm glad you feel that way. Anyway, thanks for watching this. Uh, we'll keep doing some more of these as we always do, but uh, try to keep the cadence maybe a little more frequent than how we have. So it's uh, always fun talking about golf. We don't get to do that enough, so I enjoy this probably about as much as you guys do if you're really into golf fitting and equipment. And uh, we look forward to doing this with you again. Thanks for watching.